Sure. Good morning, council members. My name is Liz Wheeler, and I am a co-founder of Secondhand Stories Farmed Animal Micro Sanctuary based in Lombardy, Ontario. I've worked for eight years in animal care and protection, first as a veterinary assistant, and now at a nonprofit organization that conduct, conducts and shares research on topics such as farmed animal welfare. I also have certifications in both animal welfare and anthrozoology. I've spoken with city staff at length and represent one of the sanctuaries consulted in the report. I stand here today to advocate on behalf of the 13 rescue chickens we have saved who are discarded by backyard chicken owners. As the report has recommended from CFIA and Toronto Public Health, so there are agencies that have been consulted about this, I will not touch on avian flu in depth, except for to counter the argument from supporters that concerns are misplaced and that cases are linked to industrial operations. This is not true. Of 46 outbreaks over the past year in Ontario specifically, 15 came from non-commercial premises. There are 700,000 chickens in Ontario that have been affected. Not 700,000 dogs, 700,000 chickens. City of Toronto engagement sessions with participants revealed that the primary method of avoiding avian flu was only to keep food and water covered. I am shocked and quite frankly frightened as this indicates that owners aren't even aware how transmission occurs through fomites, which can travel from bird droppings and dust on the ground. From comments that will be made today, I have a feeling this is not something that they are taking seriously, which is evident by their uninformed arguments. Which brings me to my next point. I am extremely concerned about the lack of public education on proper and humane care of chickens. Without proper inspection and enforcement, the city is leaving animals vulnerable to neglect and cruelty. This is especially dire when there is a serious lack of veterinary care. The city's own interview of participants even revealed that they rely on online forums and homeopathic solutions when hens are ill or injured. After joining a group called Toronto Backyard Chickens, I was able to see awful posts about chickens who were exhibiting avian flu symptoms and died. There are no reports about this. There are no follow-up on people who have had raccoons and hawks eat the chickens because of improper housing. It is very important to note that the numbers of reports of avian flu are only reported cases due, are limited due to self-reported data. Why would a backyard chicken owner say that their flock is ill if they know the program will get shut down? There have been deaths in this program that are not reported why the chickens died, but have been exhibiting avian flu symptoms. From people who are registered to speak here today, I have screenshots that their birds were showing avian flu symptoms. It is a conservative estimate, as it depends on how many people voluntarily give this information. Systems that reply on a complaint basis are notoriously negligent, yet there still have been complaints made about shelter standards, unsanitary conditions, and hen care, not to mention that between 2018 and now there have been 118 stray chicken service requests. So you have birds all around the city, not just in their coops. I'm sorry, I'll need you to wrap up, but I, I, I sense there will be questions. You will hear arguments about shutting down the pilot on the basis that it is community building and it helps build feud insecurity. The average cost of setting up a compliant chicken coop in the city is over $1,300, and 97% of households participating have an income higher than $100,000, 40% more than $150,000. So this is not about community building and food insecurity. And I fail to see the community aspect when elderly and in in, uh, okay, sorry about that. I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if you want to, uh, I have a, we'll, we'll uh, um, maybe hear from your partner next, and then we could do left questions. That I can both. cruise through this if that's okay, or you can ask me well, questions and I can respond. Well, I, 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 then I would have to. I would have 20 more times. I'd have to do that same indulgence. So I'm wondering why don't we hear from your partner and then we can just have questions of both. Yeah. Sure. So my name is Craig Wheeler, and I'm the other co-founder of Secondhand Stories, which is a farmed animal micro sanctuary in Lombardy, Ontario, as my wife had mentioned. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit differently just with my experience in accepting the surrendered hens and roosters from backyard owners who are ill-prepared and ill-equipped to manage um, the chicken care. Um, as my wife said, we've rescued 13 hens, and, or, well, 13 chickens over the past nine months. Uh, when we purchased our house, the former owners who had the backyard chickens at that time abandoned them and left them behind. Uh, this was the beginning of our rescue journey. Peggy, Betsy, Margaret, Maggie, Cora, and so Sophie and Georgie became our first rescues. Shortly after, we adopted two roosters from the Montreal SPCA who had been surrendered by an owner with backyard chickens who could not tell the difference in chicks. He only wanted laying hens, and so they were dropped off at the shelter, worthless to him. Uh, we named them Roland and Hershey. Following that, we received a request from a breeder to rehome a blind hen. This owner was breeding her chickens and indicated the surrendered four-month-old chicken was, was blind. 
Ellie's in fact a rooster. As per Urban Hen's TO pilot program, it is believed that an owner should know the sex of the chicken by this age. In our experience, that's not true. Um, we've seen countless breeders now be unable to identify the sex of a chicken. Finally, we received a request from a backyard chicken owner who indicated the purchase of three hens from a hatchery. Uh, they could no longer care for them throughout the winter, and they were told if we did not accept them by the first frost, they would likely be killed. Sorry, they would be killed. Uh, we accepted these surrendered hens and named them June, Emily, and Alma. For each of these chickens, we've been able to save, and we have received countless of other surrender requests, which we could not fulfill, including recently a request to take in 36 birds who were no longer wanted. In our 13 chickens, we've spent $30,000 alone on their care in nine months. This can be expanded on in our, or this is expanded on in our written submission. The level of commitment that is required of our 13 chickens, four of them are no longer with us. Peggy, Betsy, Emily, and June have all passed away from reproductive complications, a common cause of death in laying hens. The lack of emergency veterinary care in chickens in Toronto is a concern of mine. What will participants do when a hen is egg bound? What if a hen is coughing and sneezing? There are, there are only two veterinary practices in Toronto that are able to see backyard chickens, and in my experience, that's far too few. I also urge the community to consider what might be perceived as indirect suffering of this pilot program, which are the roosters. Uh, they're not allowed to be kept, so unless we are able to identify these chickens, uh, which we have proven not possible, uh, at least not very easily, um, these roosters will be killed. Yesterday, submitted an article from the Montreal SPCA which highlights the brutality of killing unwanted roosters, and I urge you guys to read it. If the City of Toronto is going to encourage residents to own hens, you have an ethical obligation to ensure the protection of the roosters as well. Ask any sanctuary owner, and they will tell you the pecking order is rough. When one senses illness or weakness in others, they will peck at each other, sometimes plucking feathers and even going as far to cannibalize each other. What will participants do when these behavioral issues arise and then the flock can no longer be sorted out? Where will these birds go? How will they be separated? As it stands, the only mention of any sort of contingency planning in section three of the terms and conditions, which states that if at large hens are not redeemed within 24 hours, that they may be euthanized. When someone moves, what contingency plan is in place? The Toronto Humane Society is abandoned, or, dis or sorry, the Toronto Humane Society does not accept chickens. Where will they go when they are surrendered? What will occur if a chicken is abandoned, disposed of in the wild? Will the city rehome this chicken? Where will the chicken be housed? How will it be taken care of? How will the city ensure proper disease control if various flocks are abandoned at the same time? And what happens if the backyard hens are no longer productive in laying eggs? Will the owners be required to keep them? What budget exists to manage to rehome or re these retirement of, the of these Sorry, what budget exists to manage the rehoming or retirement of no longer wanted birds? Sorry, I, I know you're trying to hurry, but I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. That's okay, we can wrap it up. <laughs> You've done a very good job of hurrying, in fact. Are there uh, questions of the deputants? Uh, Councillor Moyes. I have a question. Okay, I'll put you on the list, Councillor Robinson. So I do have two questions. Um, first of all, the recommendation states that we should and the program. So what is the issue here? Are you for or against the recommendations? Ending the program. As it stands now? Yes. Okay. And my second question is my sister has a farm up in Hastings and she has like 30 chickens. So what's the difference between her having her chickens on her farm and we having chickens in the backyard in Toronto? People in the city are not, it's a densely populated area. And from what I've seen, the city has not been able to enforce education for people who live in the city to understand what they're doing. We lived in the city before, we moved out to the country and that's when we started rescuing hens. It is extremely complex and people who say that taking care of chickens is easy have no idea what they're doing. And they say it's easy because they're not giving adequate standards. One of the things that we submitted was our 35 page operations manual, which highlights everything from biosecurity measures, which I've seen on multiple pages again that I'm happy to produce evidence for that is not being followed. It includes intake process. It includes what our emergency protocol is. It also includes uh, feeding, cleaning, safety, veterinary care, isolation protocols, euthanasia policies, responsible visitor guidelines. I don't see this happening in the city. And the main difference is that because it's so densely populated, you have those 118 chickens that are roaming around and then they're affecting people who are not willing participants in the program, people who are immunocompromised to the elderly. You'll also hear, I've seen people's presentations that there are kids that are going to people's farms. Kids put their hands in their mouths. How is that proper biosecurity? You're having children visit a densely urban population 
area, where's the chicken waste going? Okay, um, I have Councillor Robinson next. Do you have questions, Councillor Robinson? Yes, thank you to the speakers. Uh, you sound extremely knowledgeable, so thank you for coming today and traveling so far. Um, it's very fascinating to me because this, at, the, at the onset of the pilot, when City Council was debating this, I actually was saying these things, and I wasn't very popular, but about the mistreatment. So if you had to, in a nutshell, say what the issues are and that why you want to see the pilot shut down, would you say it's these three things, avian flu, lack of vets, and mistreatment? Or is there other things you would add to that, those three boxes? I think education is a, a huge, huge part to ensure that people who are participating are aware of all of the challenges of owning. And it's just the lack of contingency planning. There is so little information that is in this. There's no information about how chicken deaths are being tracked. There's no information about what inspections or regulation occurs for programs such as rent a chicken, where you're having chickens that are traveling to people's homes, then back into the same area as multiple chickens, and then going back out. Um, not to mention the stress that it causes on chickens' bodies, and then when chickens get ill, they're more susceptible to other illnesses, such as avian flu. Uh, also, there is a huge, huge gap in the funding that will be required, as suggested by city staff. It will take, at minimum, at very minimum, half a million dollars per year to run this program as is. But if it were to even be expanded, it would take more money. When you're taking that away from critical programs, we just heard about the homeless. Why are we trying to get people to have chickens? And it's not about food sovereignty because, as we showed, people have $150,000 incomes. So they don't, and I'm sorry, but if it costs about $1,300 to have a coop, which is a very, very conservative estimate, that's not saving money. You would have to buy three dozen eggs a week, and it probably won't even cover it, and that's if you're not getting your chicken vet care which then, again, can lead to illness, to avian flu. So do you think that some people, like it sounds like a magical thing, right? Like having chickens in your backyard and eggs, it's also, you know, storybookish and, and magical. But then when people get involved, they find out it's more complex. You're saying you have a 30-page guide. So you just expand on that. Yes, I'll just I'll just uh, uh, jump in there. You you mentioned that it had been submitted, and it, it is in our package. On on if you uh, go down to the emails from deputants, uh, your guide is here, and it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is awesome. so so okay. much information that's that's required. Um, do you mind if I ask you to repeat the question? Just because I think I was sorry, I was just no, no, interjecting. I, was just saying, I, was, I wanted to make sure everybody knew the guide was there. <laughs> sorry, no, rephrase, yeah. Councillor Robinson, and I'll pause the time. No, no, yeah, it's kind of like the concept of a puppy at Christmas or a puppy during COVID, and now the puppies are all going back to the shelters. So, is there some type of analogy with the chickens being a magical storybook, and then it, then it's more complex than one thinks? Yeah, absolutely. So as Craig said, we have spent $30,000 in nine months. Yes, we are a sanctuary. Yes, we are a nonprofit. So we do get a lot of funding, which we are very, very lucky for. But these owners may not be able to cover that cost. And a major, major part of that is veterinary care. We have had four hens died. One of them had an egg bound. I had to be trained how to tube feed chickens. I had to be trained how to pull an egg out of a chicken's vent. I do not think that the proper budget exists to train people so that they will be able to take care of these chickens and chickens are will die of reproductive issues there's just such a gap in education that is required there are so many things that people just don't think twice about if a chicken stops laying an egg over the winter it cannot just be because they're not laying in the winter it could be because of reproductive issues they could have tumors they could be egg bound We've had a chicken pass a double egg. There are so many health concerns with chickens, uh, and I just think people think it's a great idea. They have this idea of having a chicken and having fresh eggs, but it is so much more complex than that because they are individuals. They do have health care needs, and when they're not taken care of, they can get, cause other animals to be sick as well, such as the dog that died because it ate a Canada goose in Cambridge which is not, or Oshawa, right. one of the two, that's close. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, those uh, that's your time. Councillor Thompson, you had questions? Uh, I did, Madam Chair, and thank you very much through you to the team. Um, where did you drive in from? Uh, we drove from Lombardi, Ontario, which is about four and a half hours away, and we have gotten surrender requests from the City of Toronto. Right. And we're like almost five hours away. So in the past, people have said to me, because I've been opposed to this concept of the chickens in the backyard, they've said to me, what's the big deal? It's no problem, it's no harm. They're therapeutic and they're fun and we're able to have young children come to visit. They lay eggs and so on. So why are you concerned, Mr. Councillor? And can you tell us, just reiterate, you had a 20-second piece that you wanted to make as part of your statement. Can you tell me what that 20-second uh, um, piece of information is? Can I just, uh, sorry to interject, get ready to answer. Keep your thoughts. <laughs> we, we've hit the 12.30 mark. Yes. Councillor Thompson, since you're on the floor, I'm wondering if you could help me out here. Uh, we need to extend. We're, we're not going to finish that, and we have all these speakers, but we did we did hold out hope. Uh, I have uh, Jessica Ramos, uh, Lucas Nuzo, Sarah Allen, and Sierra Harris, if they're, if they're still with us. Can, can we move to extend just to hear those, uh, uh, those names? And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take an hour for lunch. As you wish, time. Madam Chair. Okay. Over to you. Councillor Thompson is moving. All in favor? That is, uh, that is carried. So now, if you can answer that question, I know you were loaded for bear to answer that question. Um, so I actually did manage to get through most of it in answering the other questions. Oh, um, okay. But one of the things I think that was most concerning is our level of knowledge is because we have taken courses from Open Sanctuary, and I also do work for an organization that is incredible phonolytics. It does uh, research on animal protection issues such as farm animal welfare. So a lot of the information that I have is backed by science research and data. Right. So when we're looking at information on how you can properly keep chickens, we're looking at what is the best standard of care to avoid them getting sick, to avoid any kind of welfare issues. So for us, when we built our coop, we insulated it. I've noticed in the group, there's a lot of people who have commented about having these ego omelet uh, setups. They don't have a bottom, so predators can get into them. Those are the type of things that we consider that we have been educated on, but that people in the city of Toronto aren't seeming to really grasp, I suppose. I think I'm also very worried when I joined this backyard chickens group, I mean, I have pages upon pages Somebody, and I don't believe it's my place to call them out by name, but I have four people here. Somebody who's speaking today had week old chicks that were seven weeks old and then was trying to look for a home for roosters. Somebody else who was speaking had chickens that had mycoplasmosis, but never brought them to the vet and can't prove it. And the symptoms are very similar to avian flu. Uh, said that heating in a coop is not necessary. It absolutely is because chickens can get frostbite and do get frostbite. And one of my sanctuary, another sanctuary had to rescue a rooster Roy who had to amputate his foot, which cost over $7,000 because of frostbite. Yep. Our temperatures get very, very cold. Like it's not rocket science. It is Canada, it gets cold. You need to insulate buildings if you're going to have animals in it. Right. Another person said that there are, uh, nobody's ever come to look at her coop so she can get away with having it a smaller size and nobody's been there for two and a half years so obviously regulation's not happening. And uh, somebody said that you can have a smaller shelter because as long as nobody complains, you don't need to register. And those are four people who are speaking today. And yeah. just one final question because okay. we had the vote yeah. and so on yeah. interrupts there. So it's been stated here today that we should defer this item to come back at a later date, and I suppose that part of the request is to suggest that the avian flu issue is not something that we've seen, it, because I think it was stated here, within the population of hens in the City of Toronto. You have a different view with respect to that, so two aspects, your views on that, and then should we defer this program or should we just simply um, dispense of it going forward? That is a loaded question, mm -hmm. and it was intended to be. <laughs> so I think you're you're passionate enough to be able yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I do have concerns about what would happen to the chickens if this 
if it is closed. Obviously, industrial farming is a really, really big problem, and part of the reason why we rescue chickens is because we're trying to avoid getting them into these type of situations. My fear is if this is just delayed for a year, that more people will continue to get chickens in anticipation that it will eventually get passed, which is what I've seen on these online groups, is that people are already saying, well, it's not being enforced now, so just go ahead. There are many, like, if you look at this group, look up Toronto Backyard Chickens, I feel like I'm plugging them or something, but it's, it's very obvious that people in the city of Toronto don't care about the regulations, and if it's not going to get enforced, then it, it's just going to run rampant. And if it can't be, if you can't have bylaw, I mean, the Toronto Animal Service is already experiencing a strain on the resources. That's one of the things I read in the report. I read all of the reports. I printed off every single thing that somebody submitted. Everything that I have looked at indicates that this is not going away. There are only more cases that are occurring. I did submit something specifically on avian flu. Silly me, it's the one thing I didn't print, but it's a two-page document that links every outbreak and how bad it is getting. It used to not transmit from mammal to mammal, and now it is. Now we have a dog that's caught it. There was an 11-year-old child. Uh, it is in another country, so I will recognize that it's not in Canada that it occurred, but it is the first time that a child has caught avian flu from a backyard flock. And I'm sorry, but wild birds don't, like migrate, migratory birds don't just stick in one place because you don't believe in avian flu. You can't control the spread. And it's an epidemic right now, but it could become a pandemic if we're not careful. And that will be on the city council. If it becomes a pandemic, it will be on city council. Okay, thank you. That, that's your time, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mantis, you had some questions? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, to the deputy, the people that have a higher income level, do they see these chickens as uh, urban farming or sustainable food, or is it more, uh, are they pets of the family? You want to that wouldn't be up for me to say. You would have to ask some of the people that make $150,000 here. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, all the questions that I had have actually uh, been asked, so so I want to thank you and, and uh, uh, apologize for the wait. 